This is Thursday, December 8th, 2011. We are in Natick, Massachusetts, and this tape is part of the Morse Institute Library's continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is Maureen Sullivan. Our cameraman is Dan McDermott of Natick Pegasus. We are privileged to have with us today Robert B. Peels. Welcome, Bob. Thank you. May I ask when you were born? March 9th, 1925. And where were you born? In Brooklyn, New York. And what town do you live in now? Uh, in uh, Milford, Mass. Your marital status? Married. Children? Son and a daughter. Grandchildren? Two granddaughters. Okay. And that's as far as we go. Okay. Uh, tell us what childhood was like in Brooklyn, New York before the war. It was very nice. I remember when my street was paved for the first time. Uh, I like growing up there. Mm -hmm. We lived in a two-story house in the second story, and it was very pleasant. Mm -hmm. And what did I, your uh, parents do for a living? My father at that time was uh, an assistant manager in a branch office of the Brooklyn Edison Company. So what was, um, what was the depression like? Did it hit you hard or your... It didn't. My father always had a job, which is okay. fortunate. Uh, he did a lot of worrying, and I guess it took its toll on him, but mm -hmm. he always remained employed. Mm -hmm. Was he um, in World War I? He was in World War I, yes. And what did he do? He was uh, in the Signal Corps. Mm -hmm. And what was your uh, schooling like? Well, it was very nice up until second grade. Third grade began to pale a little bit. <laughs> what happened? Oh, I don't know. It just, I guess uh, what happened is that uh, I moved from Brooklyn to Rockville Center, New York, which is about 20 miles away. Mm -hmm. uh, and in New York City, mm -hmm. the schools had semesters, one, one A, one B, two mm -hmm. A, two B. I just finished three A and we moved out to Rockville Center mm -hmm. and they didn't do that. I had to start third grade all over again, which kind of annoyed me. I uh, can't say that I blame you on that one. Were you um, educated on what was going on overseas? Was uh, that like with Germany? Not really until the war started. Okay. We heard about the Nazis, of course, in mm -hmm. 1933 and so forth. And uh, where were you when Pearl Harbor was attacked in 1941? We were visiting my aunt, my father's sister, and her husband. Mm -hmm. And we caught it on the radio. Mm -hmm. And so you would have been... So 16. 16 at the time. And how did that make you feel? Angry. Mm -hmm. Who do they think they are? Okay, so you would have been in high school at that time. Yes. So you would have been in high school a couple more years and then Uncle Sam came a-calling? Well, they came a-calling before I graduated. Really? They didn't waste any time. I, mm -hmm. My birthday was in March and uh, in April I got the notice. And tell us about that. Well, I really wanted to enlist. Mm -hmm. My mother would, she would fall apart if that happened. My mm -hmm. father would have been all right, but I decided, well, I'll let things take their course. I had signed up for the Army Specialized Training Program, mm -hmm. which I didn't follow up on, and I'm very glad of that. So you were in the Army. I was in the Army, yes. And what was, uh, why the Army? Just because my father was in the Army. <laughs> Not a very good reason, I guess. <laughs> All right. So uh, did family or friends join the service when you did? Well, it was one, I had one classmate that went with me mm -hmm. through basic training and so forth. And uh, there were, oh, half a dozen mm -hmm. guys 
but we're not 18 yet to try to enlist in the Marine Corps. Oh boy. <laughs> and, uh, and quite a few of them uh, ended up there or in the, in the service somewhere okay. in the Navy too. And what was your classmate's name? My classmate was uh, DeWitt Hardment, H-A-R-D-M-A-N-T. All right, and where did you, where did you go to basic? In uh, Camp Brandt in Rockford, Illinois. And was this the first time you were out of New York State? Well, I've been to Canada as a little kid when mm -hmm. my family took a vacation up there, mm -hmm. but that was all. Okay, so tell us a bit about BASIC. Well, it was a medical training camp, mm -hmm. which was disappointing. But as far as the location was concerned, it was great. Mm -hmm. It was summertime, we lived in tents. Uh, Rockford was a very hospitable town, and it was farming country so that when we had eggs for breakfast, they were real cackleberries, not powdered <laughs> eggs. That must have been a treat. That was. Okay, you had mentioned it was a medical training camp. Yes. Were you uh, trained in the medical field or was no, it just? No, not at all. The, mm -hmm. the theory was that they just throw your folders up the stairs and whatever tread it lands on, that's where you go. And where did you go? Uh, after basic? Mm -hmm. Well, I went to a uh, replacement depot in Pennsylvania, and all we did there was change our uniforms and get a new gas mask. Mm -hmm. And we went to a port of embarkation uh, near Newport News, Virginia, Camp Patrick Henry. Mm -hmm. And I was very fortunate. We went on a big ship, the Empress of Scotland. We went over without a convoy and we made it in eight days to Casablanca. After we arrived at Casablanca, the 88th Division arrived there. They had spent 30 days in a convoy of Liberty ships. That must have been awful. It must have been. I mean, you get there in eight days. And what was, uh, where were you, uh, what unit were you in at this point? Uh, I was just a replacement. Just a replacement, okay. So what happens now in Casablanca? Well, we got a pass, three of us got a pass and looked the town over. Mm -hmm. We didn't find Rick's place. Uh, but it was very nice. Mm -hmm. Seen from the sea, it looked like a modern metropolis. Mm -hmm. Tall apartment buildings. But uh, down on the ground, it was most, mostly uh, mud buildings, uh -huh. especially in the, uh, in the, I can't what they called it, the mud quarter. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, the native quarter, mm -hmm. we were warned not to go. Okay. So this, is, this now takes us to about late 1943, is it? Uh, almost, yeah. It's okay. getting, getting on. And we went by train mm -hmm. to... Uh, Oran in the same freight cars my probably father probably rode in in uh, World War One, the forty and eights. Okay, and the uh, Oran is in North Africa. Oran is Oran. in Al okay. Algeria. Syria. Okay. And what happened then? We got on a boat for uh, Naples. Naples, boy, you were doing a lot of traveling. Yeah. I do well, I guess, well, the submarines were uh, problematic, were troublesome, I should mm -hmm. say, uh, which is why we landed on the Atlantic coast and went by rail and then boats mm -hmm. across the Mediterranean. Mm -hmm. Any impressions on the Middle East? I didn't see much of it, uh -huh. really, but the climate was beautiful. After it stopped raining, that is. Ah. But this is in uh, late, uh, about mid-December. Okay. And it finally stopped raining, and that's when we went to Italy, Naples. Mm -hmm. So tell us about Naples in December 1943. 
didn't see much of Naples. We were all replacements went to what we called the Repel Depot, mm -hmm. or a replacement depot. And there they formed us out to uh, active units. Okay. And I went to the Third Infantry Division. And what was your rank at the time? Private. Still a private, okay. And where was the 3rd Infantry Division at the time? It was uh, in the Leary Valley, not far from Casino. Okay. So we're talking Central Italy, Northern Italy? Uh, well, just a little bit north of, mm -hmm. of uh, Naples, not that far. Okay. And you mentioned your uh, classmate in basic. Was he with you? No, no, I don't know what happened to him. We split up uh, and uh, we lost track of each other. Okay, so tell us what happened in Casino. Well, it was rugged country. Mm -hmm. I was part of a little squad and it was hard to get around in that rough country. Mm -hmm. But for me, it lasted only 12 days. And then we went into Bivouac near Naples. Mm -hmm and we started practicing amphibious landings. Okay. And uh, my clothing used to be washed by an Italian woman mm -hmm. who uh, gave them back to me a day early because she said, you're leaving tomorrow. So much for military secrets. <laughs> and we did leave and made the initial landing on the Anzio Beachhead. Which of course was a major engagement. It was a shooting gallery and we mm -hmm. were the ducks. So tell us what happened at Anzio. Well, it's hard to say. Okay, <laughs> but, it's all right. But, uh, it was flat country. It mm -hmm. was the former Pontine Marshes that Mussolini had filled in and starting a farm, started a farming community. Mm -hmm. And the trouble was the Germans, as usual, were sitting up in the mountains shooting down at us. And sometimes you just couldn't move in the daytime. Mm -hmm. So we did most of our attacking and what have you at night. Mm -hmm. And uh, were you wounded at any point? Yes. And what happened? Well, uh, we were next, I was in F Company, we were next mm -hmm. to H Company, which was our heavy weapons company. Yeah. And they were moving their anti-tank guns around in preparation for a rumored uh, tank attack. And a shell came over and hit eight of them. Mm -hmm. Well, I was a medic and I was a company aid man and another fellow and I went out and we were treating the wounded. Mm -hmm. And another shell came over. It came over my head from behind and should, I thought, throw all its stuff forward. Mm -hmm. But a sharp pain in the shin told me that I was wrong. <laughs> Okay, you, um, you're a medic now, you, you've just been wounded. Uh, yeah. What happened then? Well, uh, I patched myself up with a mm -hmm. Carlisle bandage and sulfonilamide. Mm -hmm. And uh, since there were nine of us that were wounded, they called for an ambulance. Mm -hmm. And daylight was approaching, but the ambulance came anyway and mm -hmm. we the seriously wounded men were in the back in stretchers, litters we called them, mm -hmm. and the rest of us sat on laps and hung on on the outside and so forth. And we got to a uh, uh, an aid station mm -hmm. and were treated there, or were examined anyway, and then put in a uh, six by six for a ride to uh, the evacuation hospital on the Angel Beachhead. Mm -hmm. 
And a six by six was? Uh, it was a, a truck, a you truck. know, okay. six wheel drive, six powered mm -hmm. wheels. So as a medic, you saw a lot what happened during and after a battle. First of all, uh, did you feel that you, we were adequately prepared and adequately equipped? Not really. Mm -hmm. uh, I thought it was what my son calls the Band-Aid course is what I had. Mm -hmm. And I really needed something better than that. Right. But uh, I, I kept telling myself, you're saving people, but really in the back of my head was, you're not prepared for this. I'm sure you weren't alone. Mm -hmm. So let's uh, get ourselves back to the EVAC hospital. Tell us what happened then. Well, I stayed there. They operated on my leg to mm -hmm. clear the shrapnel out and everything. And that same night we went on an LST back mm -hmm. to Naples and to uh, a station hospital. Mm -hmm. And how seriously was the wound in your shin? It was not bad, but it was initially it was shell shocked. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it hurt to put my weight on it. Right. And how long were you at the evac hospital? Uh, well, it's a matter of hours to okay. the evac hospital. And then you were taken to Naples. Yes. And tell us what happened then. Well, uh, I stayed there for three months. Mm -hmm. uh, I had a uh, graft put over the wound, mm -hmm. skin graft, which didn't take. Ooh. But the, wheel, the wound healed by itself mm -hmm. and left it with a muscle adhesion. So I was sent home. That was very nice. <laughs> Sent home to New York, wow. Well, the, I guess the policy was that if you're going to be in the hospital more than three months, they might as well send you home instead of sending food to feed you and so mm -hmm. forth. And my only claim to fame is seeing Mount Vesuvius erupt from the hospital in Naples. Wow. And when was this? That was in March, April of 44. And it wasn't until Oh, a half a dozen years ago, I saw an old newsreel mm -hmm. that showed the lava coming down the mountain and pushing over buildings. Mm -hmm. Must have been an incredible sight from the hospital. Yeah, well, in the daytime, all we could see was a dirty gray cloud over the top of the cone. But at night, you could see the white lava flowing down the inland side. Wow. So now you're back in uh, Brooklyn? No, I uh, was sent, well, initially we went in convoy back to Newport News mm -hmm. and uh, by train to uh, Newton B. Vicar General Hospital. Mm -hmm. The policy was to send you to your home state if you're going to be hospitalized. So right. They flew me up to Rome, New York, mm -hmm. and by ambulance to uh, Rhodes General Hospital in Utica. Okay, so now you're practically in the middle of New York State. Yeah, and I had my first trip home, and mm -hmm. New York State never looked so good. Hmm. Um, during the time you were in Italy, did you maintain contact with your family? Did they write letters? Yes, we wrote. Mm -hmm. And uh, did you keep up with uh, news of the war? Yes, we could. Uh, we had the stars and stripes, of course, mm -hmm. that told us what was going on. And we were on in the middle of the Atlantic on the way home. We mm -hmm. heard about the uh, invasion of Omaha Beach and uh, Wow and uh, Normandy. And here you were heading in the opposite direction. Yes. So now you're in uh, middle of New York. It's getting middle to late 1944. 
Were you still in the Army? Oh, yes. Yes. And yes. tell us what happened. Uh, well, uh, I stayed about a month in the hospital there, mm -hmm. and uh, nothing happened. I had an interview with a doctor who said he was going to send me to Valley Forge General Hospital in uh -huh. Pennsylvania to correct the muscle adhesion. Mm -hmm. And that's where I went. I was there until March 1st of 45. Okay. And then I was sent to uh, a convalescent hospital at uh, on Cape Cod. Not a bad place to convalesce. No. Well, it looked like the end of the earth when we arrived. It was mm -hmm. cold. The sea was slate blue. It looked hard and mm -hmm. cold. And there was nothing but sand around. Mm -hmm. But uh, after a while, we became acclimated, and uh, we got weekend passes to Boston. And how long were you down in, at the Cape? Uh, for three months, and mm -hmm. I was discharged from the convalescent hospital there. Which brings us to when? To uh, May the 3rd, 1945. So, you, and what happened after that? After that, I got ready to go to college. Okay. Which I did on Public Law 16. Let's head back to uh, May 3rd, 1945, which was just, of course, a few days right before VE Day. Yes. Uh, how did you celebrate? Well, I didn't celebrate at all. What happened? <laughs> well, I thought it was great, mm -hmm. but uh, it's over. Mm. or at least in Europe. Right. So you were discharged from the Army and not just from the hospital on no, May 3rd? No, from the Army. Okay. Mm -hmm. So now you're back to being a civilian. And well, the war is just about wrapped up. Uh, how about when you heard word about um, the atomic bomb? At that time, I had taken a summer job in a YMCA camp. Mm-hmm. And that's when we heard about VE Day. Mm -hmm. I mean, VJ Day. V yeah. Yeah. Before then, when I was still in uh, Newton D. Baker General Hospital, we first heard about the uh, super fortresses, mm -hmm. the B 39s. And one pilot who was interviewed said it was like sitting on the front porch and flying the house. Wow. How about when uh, Roosevelt died? I was still in the Army at, mm -hmm. uh, on Cape Cod, mm -hmm. and uh, I had made arrangements to visit my grandfather's cousin in Mattapan, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, we went to church the next Sunday morning to, mm -hmm. to a service there. Okay. But that was a sad time. It was. Okay, so now let's get back to you being out of the Army. You were getting ready to go to college. Where did you go to college? MIT. And what was your major? Architecture. And did you go to MIT on the uh, GI Bill? Yeah, uh, well, it wasn't the GI Bill. It was Public Law 16 for disability. Okay. And what did you do after college? After college, I got a job in New York City. Mm -hmm. That was, I lived most of my life on Long Island. Uh, and I commuted to the city mm -hmm. like my father did. Yeah. And what did you do for a career? Well, I worked as an architect. Mm -hmm. And what kind of architect? What kind of architecture? Yeah. Well, uh, commercial, residential? Uh, no residential, mm -hmm. if we could avoid it. Because to make a living in residential architecture, you have to have it in your fingertips and mm -hmm. no wasted motion. Do it quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, what I worked on mostly was um, college and university buildings. Mm -hmm. Even worked on, a, on an auto factory in Virginia. A Volvo factory. Really? 
And how long were you in the field? I, uh, let's see, it was 1990. Mm -hmm. I was 65. And I decided I, 40 years of commuting on the Long Island Railroad was enough. So I moved my office home. By that time, I was writing architectural specifications and structural mm -hmm. specifications. So I was able to uh, continue working mm -hmm. with no missing time. Mm -hmm. And that was fun. I wished I had done it sooner. Because I, uh, well, I kept regular hours because my clients did. Mm -hmm. Still, when my wife and I felt like it, we could go take a two-hour picnic in the park. And then finally at uh, age 73, I retired. Okay. And what are you doing these days? These days? I'm still retired. <laughs> 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 but we, uh, my wife and I, uh, get out and about. We eat regularly at senior centers. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's fun. Yeah. My daughter and her husband uh, bought an in-law house. And we live in a, in a very nice apartment in mm -hmm. the back. Okay, tell us a little bit about your son, who I understand was, is a Vietnam veteran and was as you termed it, the only uh, army professional in the family. Yes, he stayed in for 24 years. Mm -hmm. But he, he had a low draft number and he would have been drafted and he didn't want any part of that. Mm -hmm. So he enlisted. And what's his name, by the way? David. David. And what did David do when he was in the army? Well, he took infantry basic training mm -hmm. and then he uh, applied for uh, uh, special forces and took special forces training mm -hmm. and ended up in the fifth special forces group and later on when he he went to language school learned a european language finnish mm -hmm. so they sent him to this 10th special forces group uh, they the first battalion was in uh, uh, What's, what's the former fort up just a bit north of us? Bert Devons. Oh, yeah, he was Devons. there for a mm -hmm. while. Uh, learned scuba diving. And, but after he learned the European language, he, uh, no, I, I, I'm getting ahead of myself. That's okay. He went to uni uh, language school again uh -huh. and uh, studied German mm -hmm. and went to Germany in the uh, uh, Berlin Brigade, and then when his time there was finished, he said, "No, oh, there's no sense in sending me back to the States. We have a battalion down in uh, Bavaria. Why mm -hmm. don't you send me there?" Which he did. So he liked that. He was in Germany 14 years old. Mm -hmm. And how long was he in the army? Uh, 20. 24 years. Okay. And uh, what's he doing these days? He's a technical writer. He taught himself. Mm -hmm. oh, well, he joined some organization of technical writers, of mm -hmm. course. He didn't know it all by himself. All right. Let's get back to you briefly. Uh, did you join any uh, like uh, service or like the Legion or the VFW? Uh, DAV. DAV. Mm -hmm. And are you still in there? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. I have a lifetime membership. And is there any, um, any experiences from your uh, wartime years that you would like to relate to us? Well... We haven't covered yet. No. Uh, uh, you know, uh, I asked you if you'd heard about Anzio Annie. Mm. That was a railroad gun the Germans had up near Rome. Mm -hmm. And they'd fire at the ships in the harbor at Natuno, and once in a while they'd hit the evacuation hospital. Mm -hmm. And uh, when the shells started dropping, a ward man came down the aisle with an armful of helmets and asked if anybody needed one. Mm -hmm. Well, a British soldier who was there didn't have his helmet. Oh dear. So 
the, you know, the same pan-type helmet the British wore in World War I. So uh, the ward man had him an American helmet, and the Tommy said, I asked for a helmet, not an air raid shelter. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Peels, anything else before we uh, wrap up this interview? I wish they would reinstitute the draft. And why would that? First of all, my son was in the army when the when the draft ended, mm -hmm. and he said we could see the difference in the quality of people we we're getting. Mm -hmm. uh, what they began to get was poor people who needed a living. Mm -hmm and joined the army for that reason. And they were good people too, but right. he said there were a lot better people that were caught in the draft. Interesting observation. Well, Robert B. Peels, we thank you for um, taking part in the Natick Veterans Oral History Project. We thank you for your service, and we just want to wish you uh, happy holidays. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you.